bag and the other reusable grocery bag to kind of serve as like an ambulance just in case. Mm -hmm. And the Wild Bird Fund's located between 87th and 88th Street. And um, this is the phone number too for park rangers if you ever find an animal that you can't have access to or don't feel safe handling that you can sort of store away and um, use for later. And okay, so step three. So you, you downloaded Merlin, you have a pair of binoculars. Um, I invite you to explore eBird. eBird is a great resource because you can log your finds like any citizen scientist, um, but it, you can do so many other things on it. It's a scientific research database that ornithologists use to track um, uh, bird populations all across the world and globally, but you can look up a million things on it. So I know a lot of people love to see bald eagles. It's, it's thrilling to see one. They're huge. They're majestic. So let me show you how you can look for one. So you just go to eBird and then you hit the explore tab and then you click on species map and then look at that. All of those red points are actually birding locations where um, a bald eagle has been seen just this year and we're only in March. So, and all of those blue locations are where um, one has been seen historically. So if you um, pay attention, your chances of seeing one uh, likely soaring over Central Park is actually pretty high. So I clicked on the one that was in Central Park. There we go. Look at all those observations in March. All these people saw a bald eagle and here we go. I clicked on one with a photo and this person saw two in Central Park. One was flying shockingly low over the ramble, hard to track. And then another one, they saw another one that day by the tennis court and included a photo. So you can use eBird to look for things. If you were interested in seeing a particular bird, or if you just wanted to poke around and see what um, somebody was seeing in another park, like Inwood Hill Park, maybe you've never gone there before, you can look it up and then you can see all the checklists of birders that have submitted so you know what to look for. Um, so um, I wanted to actually discuss how this would sort of be relevant eBird and birding to a community board meeting, um, but it's also relevant for other things that probably you guys will discuss I know in community board meetings, you guys discuss what to do with specific um, development projects that come up. You know, land is at such a premium in Manhattan, people bicker over what to do with like three feet, right? Like, <laughs> like one person thinks that like it should be developed into this or people will even bicker about what to um, put for landscaping materials. So I'm inviting you to look at eBird uh, for maybe some issues that would come up. Um, this issue came up in East River Park. Um, there was a battle of what to do with the redevelopment of this park. And they did an environmental impact study. And it was really interesting because whoever wrote the study didn't look at eBird. And they said the only thing that were there were non-native species of um, house sparrows, pigeons, and starlings. Um, so they didn't actually <laughs> take into account the environmental impact of what it would have on the bird populations that exist in the park. And eBird documented over 80 species and over half of those had um, photographic evidence. So this might be something to consider if um, things come up in your community board meeting, if an area is coming under development or consideration that you might go into eBird and actually see what kind of birds and species are being seen in an area that is being impacted and discussed. So it could be something like in Riverside Park, uh, there's an area that's, you know, they're thinking about tearing down some trees and like redeveloping the shoreline. So you could see, you could log on there and just take a look and see um, what species would be disrupted by that sort of action and what could be done to prevent it. You could reach out to scientists and talk to them about maybe a better plan of action. Um, and this is also sort of logging, uh, sort of flagging the importance of using it so let's say that you were going to Riverside Park for 10 years and you never logged any of your finds. <laughs> that means there's nothing in the scientific database should something come up um, to verify that you saw anything and that anything needed to be preserved or saved in that area. 
So if you're one of those people, and I do it too, especially for Central Park, because it's Central Park is so heavily birded. But if you, especially if you go to, I would say Riverside Park, and if you don't submit a checklist, I would reconsider and make sure that you do one for it because it's not birded as heavily as Central Park. And there might be species there that need to be documented um, for the future, um, especially with land development being what it is and how things change so quickly. You never know. Um, let's see. Oh, this is just a tip for uh, navigating in Central Park. Um, all the lamp posts, uh, like when I first started birding, I actually wasn't that super familiar with the ramble and I would get confused. It's crazy. I've been going to Central Park for over 10 years, but all the lamp posts have two numbers. So the first two numbers are what street the, it's parallel to. So this is 78th Street. And the last two numbers indicate if you are east or on the west side. So this lamp post is telling me I'm on 78th Street. And since it ends at 14, I'm on the east side. I think the letter E for even means east. And anything that ends in an odd number is west. So the last two numbers get larger as you enter further into the interior of the park. So if you were in the middle, it would be like 78, uh, 45. And if you were right at the cusp near Fifth Avenue, it would be like 7802. Hmm. So if you ever get confused, if you're in the North Woods or if you're in the Ramble, find a lamppost and then you can use it to help orientate yourself. So you, if, you're, if you're lost, um, hopefully that will help you if you didn't know that. And this is a fantastic map. It's um, called Central Park Entire. And in, if you're an Apple user, then lucky you. Um, it maps the entire Central Park, but it also has all the birding location names. And what's even more remarkable is every single tree is mapped in Central Park. Um, these two men <laughs> undertook this project. It took over three years where they walked through and they marked every they, single tree in the park. <laughs> it's, it's kind of remarkable. But it's also a beautiful way to bird because birds are attracted to certain flora. So um, I'll get to that later, but this map is just great. Um, beautifully put together and very user-friendly. So I highly recommend it, even though you have to pay for it, it should be worth more than $2.99. <laughs> All right. So another tip is um, there's something called BirdCast. And it's exactly like a weather forecast, but it's for birds. So you can check it nightly for migration and it will tell you um, what the movement looks like for birds. And it's actually pretty remarkable that they can pick up bird movement on radar and a lot of birds will move at night. Hold on, let me show you. So this is, um, this is a huge group of birds flying over the Gulf of Mexico, over the Keys. Isn't that crazy? This isn't, this isn't a storm. These are like warblers coming our way. So um, that's what's pretty remarkable about how they travel at night together. And um, it's be able to, we're able to actually predict it. And so you can check it um, before you go out in the morning and anticipate that you're gonna have either an awesome or maybe not so great day. Okay. So this is a ruby-throated uh, hummingbird. Uh, this is likely a female or a young male. It doesn't have the ruby throat. Um, they are so tiny, but they are so extraordinary. And I just really want to highlight them because they're such an extraordinary bird. That video that I just showed of the birds flying over um, nonstop. These hummingbirds will fly nonstop over the Gulf of Mexico for like over 24 hours. It's just crazy to think about. They weigh as much as a dime. Um, so last year, a pair actually nested in the ramble. Um, it was pretty cool. Their nest is only about the size of a walnut <laughs> and their eggs are like, <laughs> their eggs was just me. I didn't see the eggs, but like the, the nest was like the size of a walnut. And um, yeah, so hopefully maybe again this year she'll come back. But this one was, I, I photographed in the ramble and they're like flying jewels. They're just so, so pretty the iridescence on their feathers. Um, here's their little tongue that they use to feed on nectar. 
And um, they also feed on mosquitoes and small insects, uh, lightning fast. There, there he is yawning. You can see the inside of its mouth. And this is at Azalea Pond in the Ramble. And this is a young male. Um, you can see the black around the face. And um, if you, you have to stand, I guess, like right at the perfect angle in front for you to get that flash of that ruby red. The angle just has to just be perfectly right. Um, and if you look around Azalea Pond, the bright flowers, it will definitely attract um, a lot of butterflies and these guys too. Um, the Aztecs, I always found this funny, their god of war was a hummingbird. And if you've ever seen these hummingbirds um, out in nature, you would understand why. They'll go after everything. They attack warblers. They attack, large, they attack larger birds. They're extremely aggressive, extremely aggressive birds. So it's no surprise that the Aztecs um, had their god of war be a hummingbird. Uh, all right. So you started birding and you have no idea where to begin on how do you begin to learn to ID birds, right? Like how, how does, how do you start? So these are both red tail hawks. The one on the left is a juvenile and the one on the right is an adult. And you'll begin to look for certain things. Like for instance, the eyes, in young hawks, the eyes are usually always light. Uh, they're light, light pale golden yellow. And in adult birds and adult hawks, they're dark. And the tail feathers don't turn red until they're mature. So whenever you're first learning to ID birds, um, have as your anchor the familiar. So I think everybody knows what these four birds are. Uh, the house sparrow, the European starling, the house finch, and the rock dove. So um, when you have them in mind, keep in their size and shape. That's probably one of the most important things in learning an ID. And I don't know if you guys are aware, but all four of these birds are not native to the city. Um, the house bear and the European starling was introduced by a man named Eugene, I'm probably butchering his last name, Schifflein. And he's responsible um, for introducing them because he released a hundred European starlings in the late 1800s, right in Central Park. So Central Park is ground zero for European starlings being spread over in the entire North America. <laughs> Thanks, Eugene. And then he also introduced the house sparrow because he wanted to save his own trees from moth larvae. So this one man is responsible for these two species spreading all over North America. The, ho uh, the house finch, this beautiful house finch with everyone probably recognized at feeders, they're quite prolific. They aren't native to our region. They are native to the Southwest. And the story of how they ended up here is very strange. People were selling them in the pet stores. Um, they have a beautiful song and this was totally illegal. So they released the birds because they didn't want to get caught. And then they ended up spreading across the entire continent meeting their Western kin about 50 years later. So um, it's another introduced species. And the fourth one are rock doves and everybody knows what those are. And they were initially brought here from Europe in the 1600s for meat. So some escaped and boy, did they ever thrive. So um, use these four birds as sort of the, your guide and baseline to begin to learn bird ID. And I'll begin to clarify in the next slide. So when you're looking at birds, um, people sometimes don't know what to look for initially. And I always tell people to look for size and the shape. So you know what a house sparrow looks like and look at a black cap chickadee. It's much smaller than a house sparrow. So you know that's probably not a sparrow just by looking at it. Um, robins are medium sized birds about the size of a European starling. Uh, this American coot, if you're looking at it for the first time, um, you would probably take note of its tiny head and its giant sort of body and its very weird feet. It's very, very weird feet. Uh, the great blue heron, it's giant size, uh, noting the size, lo it's long neck, it's long legs, and it's piercing beak, long beak. So just take all of those uh, various things into account when you're trying to begin to learn ID, um, just sort of the general size and shape. Um, these are four ducks. And 
it's funny because um, I was standing at the reservoir with this person and he didn't know what to look for. And, I, and that's why I'm just bringing this up because I was telling him, I was like, look at the beak. So if you look at the herded manganser and the red and manganser, they're called sawbills for good reason, colloquially. Look at their bills. They're very narrow and uh, they're, they're serrated because they're diving ducks and they like, they need it to be that way so they can grab fish and crustaceans that they eat. And the mallard and the green winged teals are dabbling ducks that dabble at the surface. So they have a more wide um, bill. I don't know if you've ever noticed on the mallard, but they have a very cute curly black cue on their tail. It's really quite adorable. You begin to notice like small details like this once you really begin to like hone in on a bird and look for ID characteristics. And uh, green winged teals in terms of size, they're like half the size of a mallard. So if you come upon a body of water and you notice one is considerably smaller than the other, uh, take pause and really take a careful look at it more carefully. So it's probably not what you think it is. Um, this is an example of looking at size and shape. I remember the first time I saw an American red star warbler. The only bird that I knew that was um, black and orange was a Baltimore Oriole. And I was like, is that an Oriole? <laughs> but it was like, it was way too small. And then I was so confused because the way it was moving too. So again, if you think about size and shape and it's smaller, this bird is smaller than a house sparrow. And Orioles are the size of a, a European starling or robin. They're a medium-sized bird. So that can actually rule out right away if your mind wanted to go there and say, okay, this has to be an Oriole just based on that. Um, this is an example again of looking at size and shape. This is a rare goose. It's a cackling goose. And if you look at it in comparison to the uh, Canada goose, if the, when there's groups of like 500 Canada geese and there's like one cackling goose, it's so hard, but look how small its bill is in comparison to this Canada goose. It's got this short little stumpy bill. Its neck is short. It's substantially smaller. Um, I'm sure if like, because someone's pointing out it's, it's very obvious, but these are the type of things that um, you look for when you're scanning and looking at birds. Um, and there's a, another side-by-side -side comparison. So you can see how small its little face is compared to the Canada goose and just its overall body too, it's tiny. Um, looking at color and field marks um, is helpful to learn to ID birds and don't forget to look at eye color. So these are two juvenile hawks that are very common in Central Park. This is a Cooper's hawk and a red tail hawk. Um, can you tell what the big difference is? Uh, especially with um, red tail hawks, one of the telltale markers is a belly band. So if you look at the top, it's the breast is very clean and white, and then it has this like brown sort of rope um, around its belly. So that's a telltale sign that's a red tail hawk. Um, the juvenile Cooper's hawk have this sort of beautiful teardrop streaking down its chest. And their body, it's kind of hard to tell from this photo, they're much more tubular and not as bulky as um, red tail hawks, which are much beefier birds. Um, and their eye colors, because they're both juvenile, are both light, which they'll both change as they mature. Um, these are two birds that are identical in size and shape, but um, you have to begin to look at other field markers like can you tell these guys apart by looking at them? Um, the, these guys are going to come through in spring migration very soon. In fact, probably within the next week or so. So these are two birds to look out for. The top two are northern water thrush. And whenever they move, they have this really cute bobbing action with their tail. And so do the Louisiana. They kind of like sachet and they pump their tail. Uh, they're hard to watch too because they can move incredibly fast, of course. <laughs> but look at the eyebrow area on the top two birds. Um, it's thin, it's almost yellowish. And look at the eyebrow on the bottom two birds. That's a Louisiana. It's thick and it's white and it flares at the end. So that's a key distinctive um, ID marker to tell them apart. And if you look at the throat on the Louisiana on the top, it's speckled and on the bottom it's clean and it's white. The clean throat is probably the one thing that I look for. 
And then on the Louisiana, the legs are pink. And, the, and on the uh, Northern Waterfresh, they are not. They're kind of this like tan color. So these are the type of little observations that you'll get better at picking up on um, as you begin to bird more. But these two guys are coming through, so be on the lookout for them. Um, they like uh, muddy shorelines and water, so, um, and they're really fun to observe. Okay, so and in looking at color and field marks, um, so these two are both belted kingfishers. Uh, can you tell the difference between the two of them? Can you see what the difference is? Um, one of them has a rust belt and the other one doesn't. And this is one of the few species where the female is actually more colorful than the male. So the female is on the left with the rust belt and the male does not have a belt. Um, these guys are so fun to, to watch. Um, they're in Central Park. They, they blow through sometimes quickly and sometimes they'll stay for a couple days. They, they're super fast and erratic flyers. Um, they're fun, fun, fun birds, but they're also very skittish and hard to photograph. Um, here's one at Turtle Pond catching a fish. Um, this is a, a young male. Um, I think he stuck around for like a week last year at Turtle Pond and then he went up to the lock. Um, so when they do come by, I always feel like it's a special treat to see them. All right. Um, so other field marks you can begin to look for are what color is the bill and the feet? Um, if you look at the laughing gull, their feet are red. And this is a bird in breeding plumage. Um, the American tree sparrow right next to it. It has a bicolor bill. It's one of the, uh, it, that's a very distinctive feature for it. And this is a least flycatcher and it has a prominent eye ring and look at its white wing bars. Um, so these are the type of things that you begin to look for. Uh, the Western tanager also has two um, wing bars and that beautiful bright orange beak. And let's move on. And the final thing on where, how to begin to ID birds is observe where it's located at. You know, was it high in a tree? Was it spending time on the ground? Was it riding wind currents, um, soaring for extended periods? Like you're obviously not gonna, a Virginia rail is a marsh bird. Um, you're not obviously not gonna find it soaring like an, like an eagle when its habitat is uh, being in a muddy marsh and digging for grubs in the, in the mud. Um, similarly for like a black pole warbler, uh, you won't find them soaring. <laughs> like a raptor. Um, they move like lightning through shrubbery and brush and leaves. Um, so, and when you're trying to learn ID, make note of habitat and behavior. I remember um, I was at the feeders in the Ramble and this woman told me very excitedly that um, there were yellow warblers at the feeder. And I knew immediately it wasn't yellow warblers. And I was wondering, I thought it was probably American goldfinch and I was right. So American goldfinch are brilliantly colored yellow, just like yellow warblers. But um, if you look at the ID markers, look at its beak compared to the yellow warbler on the left. Um, finches eat seeds. So they have a very thick and conical beak and warblers um, eat insects. So their beak looks like tweezers, like a pair of tweezers. Um, so that's sort of like a main distinction and also uh, their behavior. Finches are very social. They'll hang out in big groups together. Oftentimes you'll see them in like maybe groups of like up to 10. You know, I've seen a whole bunch at the feeders and uh, yellow warblers aren't like that. So just, you know, make note of where you see a bird and that can help you identify what you're looking at too. Um, warblers don't uh, visit feeders, they're insectivores. Um, so another beautiful thing is to learn to um, ID birds with song. And I invite you to just pay attention more when you're in Central Park and listen um, to songs whenever you're out and about, even if you can't identify them. Uh, this is probably the most, you can hear this all winter. This is the white-throated sparrow. This is how I know winter's arrived when I hear this song. And um, these guys are leaving right now. 
Um, they're heading north to the boreal forest in Canada where they breed. Um, but these guys are coming. This is a wood thrush. Too bad we can't hear the uh, song. Oh, you can't hear it? No, no. It, it, it's not coming through. No. Oh, no. OK. Yeah, um, Henry David Thoreau um, said the song was like enchanting. Like it was, it, it really is beautiful. If I could have my cell phone ringtone turn into it, I would do it in a heartbeat. So one of the first spring migrants to come through right now is uh, the American woodcock, pictured here. Um, this guy is very unusual looking. <laughs> they're very, very, very hard to find because um, they're so well camouflaged and um, they're low flyers and they're very slow flyers, um, which makes them very prone to building strike. Um, so if you see a bird that needs assistance, if it's one of these, it's probably not a big surprise because they're not the most agile or fast flyers. And um, they're easier to see in micro parks like Bryant Park where there's less vegetation for them to actually hide. But they've been spotted and seen in the Ramble and at the lock. Um, they're really, I think they're beautiful. <laughs> like they're jokingly called like the sexy potato. <laughs> they do a little dance when they walk. And here's um, one with his tail flared up. That long beak is used to probe the soil and they eat worms. Okay, and spring, um, March brings the return of red-winged blackbirds. There's a small population of them that end up staying year round, but they end up coming back in huge numbers. And uh, the males will display, they'll call out, you can probably hear their calling all, all the time, trying to attract a female and they'll puff themselves out and, and display their um, beautiful red wings. And this female was very receptive and said yes, and I, saw them mating. So they make these beautiful basket nests, uh, nests in the reeds. Um, and the males can actually be very, very territorial of them. I remember a great egret last year got attacked repeatedly <laughs> for coming too close to their nest. Um, so they're, they're very, you'll see tons of them this summer, just an overabundance of them, but they're very fun to observe. Um, March and spring also brings the return of common grackles. Again, this is a species that um, stays here in all year, but they come back in huge numbers. Um, so you'll be seeing a lot more of these guys in the park and they're just beautiful. The iridescence on their head um, is, is, is on the males is blue. Their eyes are just yellow and shockingly bright. They're really cool to watch and they always hang out in huge groups. So if you see one, you'll be sure to see many more. Um, and March, uh, spring and March brings the return of American Robin. You're probably seeing them now. I, I know that it's spring, like once the earth begins to warm up, um, you'll see these guys all over the lawns eating worms. Um, and they have at least uh, three different broods a season. So it's about like midsummer where it just feels like the entire park will be taken over by Robins. There's, there's just like, I remember one time I was like just sitting on a lawn. I think I saw over 80, like in just one, in one small area. So they have a lot of babies and those babies grow up very fast and just like two to three weeks, they're out of the nest and ready to go. And springtime, I just took these um, about like last week. And these are the famous Fifth Avenue Hawks. So if you stand at conservatory water, and if you look east, um, the building that's above uh, the old La Pan building, um, look for this nest. It's very high up though. You will need binoculars to get proper viewing of it. Um, this is, couple supposedly has been there for years and this is the legendary pale male. Um, there's controversy that pale male is long gone and dead. I'm not going to go there, but I will say a legend never dies, right? So like 
I won't say that he's dead, but um, last year this nest failed. Um, the female was clearly incubating eggs and sitting on them, but nothing hatched. So hopefully this year, these guys will have better luck. And um, if you're in the park and around that area, definitely make it a point to, to see if you can spot them. Um, you will need binoculars though. And this is a great book to read. Um, Murray Wynn wrote a famous book called Red Tails and Love, the whole true life saga about these hawks on Fifth Avenue. It was, a, it was a fun and enjoyable read. So if you're looking for something a little bit lighthearted and not so heavy to get away from all the political um, craziness, then this is a good book to pick up. Um, one of the first uh, spring warblers to come through is a pine warbler, is this guy. And they are so cute. And their song is just so beautiful. Um, warblers that are coming through um, can be hard for, I think, um, if you're just starting out birder to see because they're so small and they move so, so fast. Um, but these guys can be relatively cooperative and true to their form, you, you can find them in pine trees. Um, last year, one was seen around this time uh, in Shakespeare's garden. And I took this photo um, by the conservatory garden by Fort Clinton in those pines over there. Um, this is the same guy in the appropriate habitat in the, in the pine tree. Um, Eastern Phoebe is one of the spring migrants and they're here in the park right now. So if you're birding, be on the lookout for them. And they're, uh, they're fly catchers and they have this beautiful like pumping action to their tail while they're sitting there. So that's a good key identifier because um, fly catchers can be a little bit tricky to identify because they're not as colorful as other birds. Um, uh, Golden crown kinglet, these guys are here and they're so cute. They're like the size of like hummingbird cute and they move like lightning through trees. Um, so they can be a little bit hard to spot, but when you see the one, it's, it's pretty rewarding. Um, and they will be here, they're just starting to trickle in, but they tend to be in big groups too. Like I've seen like a group of like over a dozen in a concentrated area. Um, so they're social and they like to hang out with each other. Fox Excuse Sparrow. me, Gloria. Yeah. This, this, this is really, it's amazing, but we have a long agenda and I know we're gonna have a lot of questions for you. So maybe you could move a little bit faster towards oh, sure. the end. Oh, sure, 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 sure. Okay. Uh, Barbara, it's, it's sorry, you, you put this item on the, you chose to put this item on the agenda and allocated 40 minutes for it. Do you want to continue with it? I didn't hear you, Clary, I'm sorry. I said that you put this item on the agenda and allocated 40 minutes for it. Do you want to continue with it indefinitely? Well, I, I asked Laurie if she could move quickly now through to the end because we do have other people waiting. Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, okay, so this is a black and white warbler. Um, they hunt for insects and they move like nuthatches or creepers. Um, here we go. And that's a uh, red breasted nuthatch, white breasted uh, nuthatch and brown creeper. They move like that. Uh, these two are warblers that are very easy to see. I feel like they're typically low and not high in treetops, common yellow throat and black throated blue. Um, yellow rump warbler. These are the, some of the first migrants to come through. So you'll see them soon. And palm warblers, um, they bob their tail as well. So be on the lookout for them. They're one of the earlier migrants that should be here anytime now. This beauty is a hooded warbler. Um, and he was pictured at the lock. Uh, they're fairly common. Uh, and this was seen in Riverside Park, a very rare golden wing warbler last season. Again, the Louisiana and Northern water thrush. Uh, spring marks the return of these three um, swallows, uh, barn, tree, and Northern West wing. And the great egret arrives around April, which is the symbol of uh, National Audubon Society. These guys were almost hunted to extinction because of their plumes. Um, the face is very bright green in spring and then in yellow it turns uh, and then in summer after breeding plumage fades it turns yellow 
So from green to yellow. Um, another effective way to bird is by flora. Uh, look for berries, uh, birds love berries. And this is cotton Easter bush, which uh, warblers love to eat. And this is right at West 85th by the children's playground. This will bloom, these beautiful pink colors. Vireos also come through. This is a white-eyed vireo, a Philadelphia vireo. And these are scarlet tanagers. Um, these birds really like tulip trees. So that map, um, Central Park and Tire can help you find them. We get solitary sandpipers. They nest in the Arctic. And these are cedar wax wings. And these guys nest in Central Park. Mm. They're beautiful, aren't they? Yeah. They're very social. And um, if you see one, you're guaranteed to see, I've seen up to like 20 of them um, in a group just descend down out of nowhere. Um, this was taken at the pool in Central Park. Um, they all just dropped down and decided to bathe. Baltimore Orioles nest in Central Park and they make beautiful hanging nests. This is a double crested cormorant. You're going to see, no exaggeration, probably like 40 or 50 of these in Central Park in the summertime. They're just everywhere. They nest in the East River in huge, huge colonies and they're voracious eaters and hunters. This is a great blue heron. Uh, this is a very sort of common large uh, bird that you can see quite easily and they're fun to observe and very beautiful. This is my favorite heron, a green heron. Oh, in the summertime you'll see a lot of babies. Um, so the baby ducks, baby geese. And then in the fall and winter means uh, raptors and waterfowl. Uh, the black cat chickadee is a bird with the most remarkable memory and it's being studied here at Columbia University. Uh, their survival is dependent on storing food in thousands of locations. So this bird, is his brain is being studied for this unique ability. Hooded mergansers in their courtship ritual, the males will extend their neck and flare their hood. Uh, they're here in the fall and they're gonna depart soon, so. <laughs> well, we, we really we want any time at all for questions. I'm so sorry. This it's is okay. A wonderful presentation, but um, I think we have to end now, and we'll take some questions for okay, you. Sure. Is that okay? Sure, sure. Thank you so much. If you want a little bit of help, Barbara, I know Robert has his hand raised. Robert, please. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, when I was in the in the third grade, I played a cardinal. That's my theater debut, my, my, <laughs> and my only my only debut. So that has been forever my favorite bird. We used to see them. Are we still seeing them in the park here? Oh yeah, they're very, very, very um, prolific. If you go into the ramble, you'll see it tons of them. And in fact, they're so friendly, they'll come up to you. Yeah. Um, yeah. I found a banded cardinal in the lock that was eight years old, and she was um, born in Maine. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, they're very much in the park. And the different colors, it's not just red, are they? Yeah, um, the females are brown, and they, um, they, can, uh, they have red tips. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Ken, did you have a question? Yeah, um, for, first of all, I just thought I'd mention, I, for anybody who's interested, I put a link in the chat uh, to a video that my uncle did. Um, on identifying birds by their songs, about a 20-minute video. But uh, this is so lovely, this um, presentation, um, and the photography is so beautiful. I'm wondering, um, uh, have you um, presented this to schools? Um, uh, I think uh, maybe also Bloomingdale Aging in Place might be very interested in it. Um, you know, I'm just wondering, are, are we the only uh, audience for this? Um, I haven't presented to a school, no, no. But I am going to be um, leading walks with um, a, a group of kids that I used to work with in East Harlem. So that's going to start up soon too. But with the pandemic, things have been a little bit strange, but that's definitely going to be in the future. 
Well, this this uh, having this uh, on Zoom is a great alternative um, during the pandemic. Uh, it was really great. And uh, just one, another question: To what extent has climate change changed the migratory patterns of the birds that come to Central Park? Do you know? Well, the numbers have been declining. Of course, there's like we're in the middle of a mass ex extinction by the billions, by the billions every year. And a lot of times scientists are actually having a hard time determining where in the migratory pathway the problem is. Um, for instance, American golden plovers, they're, um, they nest up in the Arctic and they travel all the way down to South America. No one can figure out exactly what's going on. Is it their habitat that's being destroyed in, in South America? Or is it because there's too many building collisions along the way up north? And that's why sort of like the data collection of eBird is really important um, to get a better idea. Um, but the number one thing that's actually killing birds is habitat destruction. Um, I guess that's sort of linked to cap climate change, but urbanization and development that's destroying um, them. Uh, that's number one on the list. And the second thing is building collision. Wow. Uh, Mark, did you have a question? Yeah, thank you. And this was quite beautiful. I know you're pressure time, so I won't wax eloquent and just ask a quick question about, because um, Susan has mentioned this in previous meetings. Um, can you speak for just a brief moment about etiquette in terms of respecting the birds while trying to find them? Because um, I'm probably the guy who's going to blunder into the tree and make them all fly away. <laughs> oh, you probably wouldn't because you're just aware. Um, I think just... Uh, you know, that's what long lenses are for. You know, I see, you know, sometimes I see people like creeping closer and closer when that's not necessary. And sometimes you'll just have to be content to not just be getting the best view or picture, you know, with birds. And I think approaching them, if you know where a certain bird is, is not walking in a direct line straight towards them. That's never a good thing to do. Um, so you begin to learn to just read body language too. If a bird is upright and alert <laughs> and looking at you, <laughs> Eye, eye contact is never a good thing. Um, giving direct eye contact to a bird. Um, so, so it's just like the subway. Yeah, exactly. Just don't, don't, don't stare. Barbara, I thought to let you know, although I don't see any questions, there's been quite a few really incredible positive feedback from attendees. Several people, several people have said thank you. Asta says thank you. Catherine, uh, our, our, our board member, says thank you. Peter Ernst. Um, and several others are just you know, very complimentary of the presentation and, and very thankful. Okay, so there was thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time and coming here today with this. Oh, yeah, of course. It was really, really great, Gloria. All right. Thank you so much for having me. Take care. Wait, wait, wait. I just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart, Gloria, and let everyone know that these pictures are impossible to take. So go out and enjoy the birds. <laughs> do not expect to get those pictures. A picture of a hummingbird's tongue is impossible. So bravo, Gloria, <laughs> thank you so much. Before you leave, Gloria, please just give your, um, the handle again on Instagram. Oh, I, just, I just put it in the chat, Barbara. Oh, okay, great. I put okay. both of them. Gloria okay. can be found on Twitter and on Instagram. And if you see her in the park, she's the person who does what she calls potato birding. <laughs> She finds a comfortable spot. She just sits there and lets the birds come to her, and they do. That's the best way. Well, All right. So Take care, everyone. Have a great thank night. You. Thank All you. right. Bye. Okay. Larry, do you? Yes. What? Do you want to present Elizabeth, or do you want me to? Go ahead. Go ahead, Bob. Oh, okay. Um, our next presentation is by Elizabeth Mazzella, the Boy. senior. Excuse me. Oh, uh, Elizabeth is the senior public art coordinator for New York City Parks and Recreation, and she's um, presenting tonight an installation uh, going into Riverside Park. The artist, the artist Adrian, Adrian Sass. I'm, I'm getting feedback of my own voice. I don't know why, but anyway, um, Elizabeth, are you there? Is Elizabeth here? She's here. Uh, she's uh, typing in the chat. I'm sorry, this is Whitney Dearden. I'm the director of public programming at Riverside. Ah, so maybe we should have Whitney start. Well, uh, Elizabeth and Adrian are the ones who have the presentation. I'm oh. here to sort of answer questions. So if there's a way we could get them both uh, visible, that would be great. Sure. I see. Say me, tell me the names again um, that, uh, that I can promote from attendees. Who are yes. they? Elizabeth Masella. 
Uh huh. And Adrian Sass. Okay, I don't see, oh, oh, I'm sorry. I made a mistake. I'll take care of this. Yep, hold on one sec. Okay, I'm promoting Elizabeth, and I'm sorry, the second name was? Adrian Sass, top of the list there. Okay, and uh, they will be, uh, they should be both now visible and able to uh, be seen. Hi, can you see me and hear me? Yes. We can. Hi. Hi. Um, thank you for the introduction, and that was a great presentation to follow. Um, the exhibition we'll be sharing tonight is also photo-based. Um, so as introduced, I'm Elizabeth Masella. I'm the uh, Senior Public Art Coordinator at NYC Parks. Um, our office permits temporary public art exhibitions in parks citywide. Um, tonight, we are here to share um, an exhibition that will be coming to Riverside Park by an artist named Adrian Sass, who's a photographer. Um, her project will consist of um, photo photographs printed on um, an adhesive vinyl that will be wrapped around the, I guess we describe them as cuboid water fountains uh, throughout the park. There's 10 of them. You've probably seen them. They're not so attractive on their own. Um, but Adrienne has come up with a project uh, where she will wrap them with photos of uh, bodies of water um, in the watershed um, upstate in New York. So that shows where our water comes from. Um, the um, photographs will be installed in June of this year and they'll be on view through October as part of our program. The artist is fully responsible for um, installing, maintaining, um, removing the artwork. Um, if there's any graffiti or anything like that, we make them aware of that and they will address it. Um, the adhesive, um, Adrian and Whitney did a test in the park, so it won't leave any residue behind. Um, and I guess I will turn it over to Adrian to share some photos and a little bit of background on the project. And Whitney, um, I don't know if you wanted to share anything after Adrian um, gives a presentation. Does Adrian have screen sharing capabilities? I'm here, I think. <laughs> Can you all hear and see me? Yeah. yeah. Okay, thanks Elizabeth. Um, I am in fact a, a photographer and new media artist and I did really enjoy Gloria's photographs. They're amazing. I don't have a lens that big so I haven't taken anything like that ever before. Um, I um, love Riverside Park. I used to live on the park as an undergraduate at Columbia in the dorms over there. Um, and um, I've since um, been developing my art practice, um, which often combines photography and new media or takes advantage of the digital aspects of photography. And um, that is what is going on in this project. I'm gonna um, share my screen. Are you seeing the presentation? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, so, whoops. Here's um, a little bit more about my um, bio, but um, at the sort of advent of the new wave of augmented reality, I started getting into how imagery can teach us more about our surroundings um, and found that, you know, the only way to do that and according to this new trend was, you know, on a screen. And I thought that that was very limiting. Um, so I thought I could do something that approaches augmented reality, but in reality um, and bring it to the park. Um, and what I've also always been fascinated by as a native New Yorker is where the water that we drink comes from and how little people that drink it every day know about it. Um, so I've been doing a little bit more research on the whole Croton Aqueduct, um, which was built in the uh, late 1800s by really visionary people who foresaw that um, the city was growing and was going to need water. Um, and um, I've spent uh, the last two summers photographing the region which they 
protected and where they built the reservoirs and um, the aqueduct that brings the water that is untreated because it comes from such a pristine source to our city by a gravity fed aqueduct. Um, and I am planning to um, advance my slide. Oops, skipped one. Well, I'm planning to wrap 10 water fountains located in Rivers Herd Park, um, all the way from the Northern ball fields at 147th Street um, down to the classic playground, I guess in your guys' district at 74th Street and might even be able to find a spot um, in Riverside South. Um, I want to show you an image of the test that we did. There we go. Um, so that uh, is a um, reservoir in the Delaware watershed, the image is, um, and it is wrapped around um, one of those, I guess, cuboid fountains as, as Elizabeth described them. Um, there are about 10 of those fountains in the park and um, they're not the most appetizing, shall we say? I'm having some lag when I'm advancing my slides. So we're skipping around a little, trying to go back one. Um, and I don't think they necessarily promote, um, you know, drinking from them. <laughs> um, and so people, you know, tend to bring bottle. I love the image of the styrofoam cup and the glass, uh, the bottle, the bottle, the plastic bottle at the, at the ball field there um, sitting sitting on, on the water fountain. Um, so I think, you know, that um, wrapping the fountains in these images is both an allusion to the kind of labeling that bottled water gets. Usually it's adorned with images of the source, like the Poland Springs or whatever. Um, and here are some of the images that I've taken of the water shed region, um, which lies both north and, uh, sorry, east and west of the Hudson River. Um, and then the aqueduct uh, is funnels the water under the Hudson um, into the city. And so uh, I think that's part of the reason why Riverside Park is an appropriate place for this piece, um, which as Elizabeth said, uh, will be up from late spring, early June to um, fall when we turn the water fountains on and then off. So that's the gist of it. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Well, Barbara, I want to just say something before we take other questions. Um, we've, um, over the years in this committee, we've always enjoyed, I certainly have the presentations um, on the temporary artworks, public art in Riverside Park, and uh, as well as the Broadway malls. And we have them coming up tonight too. I think many members of our committee have enjoyed uh, seeing these projects and engaging with the artists over the years. And this is a particularly interesting one, I think. Um, and um, I will say that this particular concrete fountain is not the current model. That's not what we're getting stuck with these days. We're getting uh, slightly, uh, somewhat substantially more attractive uh, uh, water fountains these days. Um, but to put this in another context too, um, I think we are very grateful to both the Broadway Mall Association, Mall Association and um, the uh, uh, Elizabeth's uh, program within the park system, uh, New York City Parks Department of bringing to us, even though we, if these are done deals and it's not a matter of our approving or disapproving, I think we've always been grateful uh, to have these presentations uh, for us to, uh, to look at and talk about. On the other hand, uh, we learned recently, that many of you may have learned on well, email that the Riverside Park Fund is gonna have a massive um, public art program in Riverside Park this summer that they've not brought to us and are not presenting to us. Um, um, we are actually, I was going to reach out to see about presenting that at a future meeting since uh -huh. we were waiting to finalize some details. So we do hope to come to you um, hopefully next oh, month and I can okay. reach out after well, this. Elizabeth, that will be good. It's also, yeah. assume it certainly has been presented already as a done deal. Um, but in any event, I don't think we're going to need a resolution on either of these tonight. Um, but um, let's turn to questions that people have for uh, the artist and for Elizabeth or her colleagues. Uh, 
Barbara, do you want to call on people? If there are questions. Uh, yeah, I had a question. Yes, um, did you say Robert, Clary? No, I asked if Barbara wanted to call on. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. But That's I'm sure she'd be happy to call on Robert. I'll go after. Go ahead, go ahead, Robert. Barbara's letting you go first and she's gonna go second. Oh, okay, Adrian, uh, I'm a photographer too, and this is a very clever project. And as um, <clears throat> I don't consider these concrete structures particularly offensive, I think that you found a really good use for them. <laughs> and um, so they become uh, markers or they become this and that, and uh, they could become uh, nests, any, any number of things. But I think that your, your project is uh, really brilliant. Now, what is your medium here? Is this mylar that you're putting your images on to wrap? How are you doing this? Um, it's a vinyl that is made for these types of, or you know, not necessarily, more, more for advertising probably. Um, and it has uh, an adhesive on the back. It's a photographic print on this vinyl material that has adhesive on the back that is activated with heat. So it's actually like a little, um, gas powered blowtorch that the installer uses to apply the image and it gets a little bit shrunk and stuck um, to to the fountain. Um, and, and we did, we did, and you know, and it, it takes out, you know, the, the fountains aren't necessarily in the best shape. So they have little chips and nicks and the, That's fine. Um, the yeah. image, yeah, sticks like gets in those nicks and crannies and, and, and I think it looks good. And then it does, it does, it does come off, um, you know, in the test, we were able to, to take it off. Um, hopefully, you know, it, it did take a little bit of dedication and, and hopefully it's not, you know, something that people will take upon themselves to do every day, but um, we can replace them if, 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 if someone does. Well, that's, that's what I was getting at because um, if it's vinyl, it has permanence and I would want to see these attached all the time because they work in, in, in a concept. So it's not two or three. If you have 50 of them, and then, you know, it draws attention and they become, uh, you know, teaching instruments, whatever, you know. You all right. All right. I like that. I like that plan, too. We're going to start. We're going to start with the 10 for a couple months and then maybe we'll make some <laughs> Thank you very much. That's another reason to get over there and, uh, and for this nice long walk to see your work there. So I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. So, Adrian, uh, first of all, congratulations. The photos are beautiful. Um, my question was whether or not you have any um, informational material that goes along with them so that it's a learning experience. You say that most people don't know where our water comes from, which is probably true, but is there anything that tells you what reservoir it is or what body of water that we're looking at? Yeah, I think that interpretation aspect is going to be important. Um, I'm working with Whitney to figure out what kind of signs we're gonna have, um, ideally somewhat adjacent to the piece so that the piece can stand as an artwork in and of itself. Although I think that I am gonna label the photographs themselves with the location or you know the name of the reservoir and probably the county. So, you know, Ashokan Reservoir, Catskill, New York or something like that. And that'll be in the image on the fountain and then there'll be a sign next to it that tells you um, about the project itself and you know the other fountains that are in the park that you don't aren't looking at if you're only looking at one fountain and and more about the um, the the whole uh, aqueduct and the water system itself. That's great. And it, and they'll be there from the time they turn the water on until the time they turn it off. Yes. Fantastic. So it's you know spring to fall. Great. Barbara, if I could follow up on that, on your question, is it, will you have, or is, might it work to have on whatever your interpretive signs, or your explanatory signs, um, a reference to a website or something where people could go on it, something on the DPR website, for instance, or otherwise to sort of get the full picture here of, of um, how, I mean, not necessarily a long treatise on how New York City gets its water, but a little more of an explanation that pulls it all together in terms of- Yeah, yeah, yes, that, that'll definitely be part of the, um, of the interpretive, of the sign. Of That's the sign. great. Ken, do you have a question? Yeah, um, I agree with Robert. This is very ingenious. Uh, 
use of the photographs and wonderful placement. I love the, uh, the water bottle uh, reference. <laughs> and I'm sure the water's better. Um, and uh, uh, my question is, um, is there um, anything uh, to prevent uh, graffiti or desecration? Uh, how, how easily could these be uh, desecrated? Because the, that would be terrible. The printer assure, says that the vinyl is graffiti uh, resistant, <laughs> whatever that means. So uh, depending on in what way, you know, in what way it's desecrated, it may be washable, um, like marker or paint. If it's um, scratched or torn, which again is hard, it's not something that can happen by accident, but if someone really dedicated themselves to it, they probably could um, rip it off or peel it. Off. And the, the good news is, I guess it's like, they're not that expensive to replace. So um, we can address damage as, as needed. We are fortunate as always to have with us tonight, Jeff Martin, who I see there on the screen, who's the uh, uh, um, manager, day-to-day -day manager for Bishside Park, who's been dealing with just massive, extraordinary graffiti problems in the park this year. So uh, Jeff, um, <laughs> we hope this won't add to the list um, but we know you're up, you're up to it if, if it happens. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think it'll be fine. Every time we, we put um, stuff like this in the parks, um, you know, when I was in Brooklyn, uh, there was an artist who put uh, in a, a, what I thought was a really tough area, tough neighborhood at a bus stop. He put miniature uh, dioramas um, in that bus stop area. It was like a Green Street bus stop. And I thought, you know, they were going to get destroyed, and uh, they they survived for months and months and months. People like them, so uh, they like that kind of stuff. They so, were inside uh, parking meters. <laughs> right, you remember that, right? Yeah. It was it was the parking meter project, and 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 really nothing happened. I was surprised, but uh, I was I was happy to hear to see that that they they were all good. So we never had a problem. With it. The uh, public treats the art public art, you know, if not to say graffiti and vandalism doesn't happen, but most people are pretty respectful of it. And, you know, all of our artists are prepared to address anything that might happen. You know, if, as Adrian said, if it was beyond repair, it could be replaced or, or removed. But um, I don't anticipate that it'll happen, but we always prepare for the worst. Thank you. Jeanette? You have a question? Yes, yes. Oh. Okay. Sorry, I turned off on my mic and off my video. Um, I was just wondering, they, it said that they were going up June to October. Is that tied into when the water fountains are turned on? And if there was any way to have them go up for um, Earth Day? Uh, Jeff would probably know better, but I think it's not um, guaranteed that the, that the fountains will be on by Earth Day, though I love that idea. Um, so I'll find out when the, when the turn ons are the turn ons are coming. Uh, so if uh, if we can get them up by Earth Day, I'll, I'll make a note and see if it works for you. Um, I'll I'll ask shops, our shops people, our plumbers, if they can turn them on uh, prior to Earth Day. We'll see. Um, so I'll put the request in and uh, see what we can do. Thank you. Anybody else have a question? I don't see any other raised hands. Um, I don't have a question, but I will just add one thing is that we are planning a sort of opening celebration slash art talk uh, for when the pieces go in. So- um, Would that be virtual with me? Uh, it would likely be virtual. Um, if we can gather outside distanced, um, that will be great, but it also depends on what the Parks Department protocols are at the time of the event. So unfortunately, I don't, I don't know exactly what form it will be yet. I do want to explore having a virtual option uh, for those of us who are, may not be comfortable coming outside just okay. yet. Please, uh, let us, please let us know as you're planning that. I'm sure there are people who will be interested in it. Yes, um, I, I should be publishing the uh, Summer on the Hudson schedule within the next a uh, couple weeks, uh, so I will be sure to send an email to CB7 uh, once that's live. Great, thank you. thank you. Thank you for the presentation and thank you Adrian, we look forward to it, I'm sure. 
Thank um, you all. And I do, I will just thank um, Whitney and Elizabeth who have been really, really helpful in getting to this point and working with them. It's been a pleasure. So nice to meet you all as well. I just wanted to add, um, you know, we'll be back for the other Riverside Park project. It's right. quite a, an undertaking. So we wanted to make sure we had enough time to give everything its full attention. And I also just wanted to thank you again for the kind words and the support that you've um, given to our program. Last year was quite a challenge. Um, you know, Adrian's project and the project that Deborah is going to share were both postponed due to COVID. Um, so we are happy that we are able to move forward with projects again. And I've heard from a lot of people, it kind of was a little bit of a sense of normalcy returning, especially for programs like the Broadway malls that they've done a yearly exhibition every year. And, you know, last year we got to have Nick Holliver's pieces a little bit longer, the birds. Um, so we're looking forward to um, this year's project, which Deborah will be sharing. Right. Well, Elizabeth, thank you for your, your courtesy, your annual courtesy on all of this. And we will look forward to seeing the, uh, the, the Riverside Park Conservancy uh, art project as well as soon as you've got it ready to show us. Um, so I guess I can turn it over to you to turn it over to Deborah. <laughs> all right. Um, Deborah from the Broadway Mall Association presenting their public art exhibition, which opens this May. Um, I had a preview of it. I thought it was amazing, and I'm sure you will also. So, Deborah, you are on. Thank you. Thank you so much. And um, Elizabeth, thank you for your kind words. And Matt, I see you've been, <laughs> we're in the audience. Um, it's such a pleasure working with them for all of our exhibitions. So, it's wonderful to be back and, and um, to have the opportunity to look ahead in the relatively near future to being back with public art. Um, I am a, a board member and uh, chair of the Public Art Committee of the Broadway Mall Association. I hope most of you are familiar with us, um, but just in case there's anybody who isn't, um, we are a nonprofit working under an agreement with the Parks Department to plant and maintain the center gardens on Broadway from 70th to 150, 165th Street. Uh, in addition to the gardens, we do um, mount public art exhibitions. And um, as Elizabeth said, we come to you now with a presentation that we expected to come to you with a year ago. Um, and it's, um, I'll, I'll show you images in just a minute, but uh, it is marble sculptures by uh, the artist John Isherwood. Um, they are flowers, marble flowers. And um, so we think of this as a delayed bloom of eight marble sculptures that uh, at least metaphorically and, and perhaps in reality celebrate the return to life of the city uh, after a long and difficult winter. So let me share my um, content here and I'll just uh, talk as we go along. Um, okay, so this is an overview of the sculptures. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about John Isherwood. He's a um, well-known um, artist who is represented in many public and private collections. He's um, been, he has displayed and, and been collected in the United States and Canada, Europe and China. Um, he's uh, familiar with the city. He lives in New Jersey with his family. And we have been talking to him for some time about um, presenting on the malls. Um, there are eight um, sculptures, eight flowers in this expedition, exhibition. Five of them are um, in your 
area. Um, and six of them in total are all new work, which has been created specifically for this exhibition. So um, that's very exciting to us as well. Let's see. So this is another overview of the, um, of the sculptures. And let me move on. This is um, the Earth Laughs, uh, the first bloom, which will be in uh, Dante Park. Um, it is roughly six feet wide and uh, three feet deep and three feet high as it sits uh, on a pedestal. And you see a uh, rough, um, circle that, that shows you approximately where that's uh, going to be in Dante. A little more detail about the marble. All of this marble is um, quite beautiful. Um, they all have different names, different characteristics, slightly different hues, which you can see on the screen. Uh, the second one is um, at 72nd Street. This is actually a bench uh, in addition to, to being a sculpture. Um, and uh, that's a location where we, that we have typically used um, at 72nd Street outside the, on the south side of, of the subway station. So we're very pleased to be able to have another sculpture there. That one's, whoops, that one's a little bit wider than the other, uh, than the one you saw earlier, but these are all roughly, you know, the, the same general size. Uh, this is at 79th Street. It will fit in uh, that uh, semicircle um, that we've typically used for all of our exhibitions. Um, this is another type of, of uh, marble barred Delio Imperiale. Um, I'll talk a little bit about our, our signage uh, in a minute and, and the attribution we'll have for all of these sculptures. Uh, here we are at 96th Street. That's another um, you know, favorite location of ours in, uh, in your area. And then finally, um, is this, wait a minute. Let me just check something here. This one, I think this one is slightly out of order. Here we go. Um, this is a new location, um, which is 103rd Street. Um, we um, have been working with parks on um, um, new planting and a new um, uh, location place where we could display sculpture. This project has just been completed. You can see looking at the gardens around this platform that they're not looking, they weren't looking so good at the time when uh, the picture was taken, but it is exciting for us to have this new location and I'm sure it will be looking um, quite a bit more inviting by the time we get um, to the exhibition. Um, so let me just close this down for a minute and speak to you directly. Um, we do um, have a, um, a characteristic sign that we use for these exhibitions. It's a map. 
Um, and so each sign shows the entire exhibition. So people know that what they're looking at is just one part of a larger project. Um, when I saw the first one of these um, exhibitions in 2004 and saw the map, I immediately went and put my sneakers on and walked and saw the rest of them. And we know from feedback we get that, you know, that is uh, an important part of the exhibition. So um, the um, dimensions and the materials and the, the marble will all be explained on our signs. So I know you've had a, a long evening um, and uh, let me just stop there and see what questions you have for us. Deborah, and I'll start with something. Um, I, I noticed on the slides that a, a gallery is uh, mentioned as a quote partner here. It, it's been typical, I think, and is it the case here that um, these, uh, that a gallery is basically um, funding the project and um, will these sculptures then become um, for sale afterwards? The sculptures are certainly for sale. Um, and um, the gallery that you see, thank you for mentioning it, um, is uh, the Billy Morrison, the Morrison Gallery in Kent, Connecticut. Um, we have worked with them before. They have a particular interest in, in sculpture and um, just through a chance meeting a number of years ago, we began a working relationship. Their role is, um, is quite important in helping with um, the um, installation of the work they've now, since they've now done a number of exhibitions, they understand um, the care that needs to be taken and what is involved in the um, forklifts and cranes and you know whatever equipment is provided. Um, in this instance, um, what the um, sculpture that is going to be installed at Dante has been pre-sold to provide funding um, for shipping all of these sculptures from Italy where they have been trapped uh, during COVID um, and to provide some of the funding for the installation. So um, this has been a for us, a, there have been many aspects of this exhibition that we're pleased with the way they've been able to happen. One follow up on somewhat related to the first and my last question. We have uh, with us tonight, um, as we frequently do, Matt Genrich, who is Jeff yeah. Martin's counterpart for our non Riverside, non Central parks, and made to be the person who maintains those parks in our district. So, um, and I, you know, I think I may sound a little obsessed with graffiti tonight, but we've had massive, massive graffiti problems recently in Riverside and again. So should any of these sculpts, sculptures be um, subject to graffiti? Is it Matt's problem to clean them or how do they get uh, restored? No, it's, it's our problem um, to deal with that. Um, and yes, Matt, um, uh, in anticipation of, of this exhibition happening a year ago, uh, we did do um, site uh, inspections for all of the locations with Matt and, and Elizabeth. Um, you know, we, uh, we were concerned about this medium um, and what might happen to it and John Isherwood was adamant that, um, you know, he was responsible for anything that happened. He takes the view that um, art is generally respected and knock on wood, that has been our experience in our exhibitions on the malls. There have been very few, um, you know, cases of, of any damage and we've always been able to take care of it. So it is our fond hope that that record will continue. 
Robert, do you want to call one of these? Ken, your hand is up. Yeah. Uh, hi, Deborah. Nice to see you again. Um, uh, two questions. One, um, uh, does the artist um, pick the location of each one of the pieces where each one will be cited? And secondly, is the one at 72nd Street intended to be used as a bench? It sounded like that was the case. Yeah. Um, so first of all, um, on the site selection, you know, we've been doing this now since this is the 13th exhibition that we will have mounted. And we've figured out what we think are the best locations. Um, but uh, just in the last couple of exhibitions that we've done, artists have, you know, walked up and down the malls and found some places that we hadn't used. and suggested that we make them available. And, and so we have that um, particularly in an exhibition like this one where the artist has created site specific uh, works of art, you know, it's, it really is um, the artist's choice about where they go. And John spent, I, I have no idea how many hours John spent walking up and down we gave him a list of the sites that we thought worked well. And, you know, this is what we have. And what was your other question? Whether the bench or the bench. Oh, the bench, yes. Yes. Um, yes, it's a bench. People can sit on it. <laughs> <laughs> I had a question, Deborah. It's a little bit bizarre. It, it's not about this exhibit. It's, I, I got very, very fond of one of the sculptures from the Broadway Mall Association that was at 72nd Street, that, that seeing eye dog that got yeah. me. <laughs> and yeah. you know, I, I have pictures of that dog and there was a snowstorm and the dog was still waiting there. Like he was still waiting for somebody to come and claim him. And, and then it got vandalized and I was devastated by it. And I, I don't know what happened to it. Can do you know? Yes, yes. Um, I'm drawing a blank on the art, artist's name, but he was a wonder. He's a wonderful guy. He was so you know cheerful and accommodating, and that is the only time a, a piece has ever been removed. But it was found. It turned up in Elizabeth. I think it was Riverside Park. Do you remember? I. Uh yeah, that was before my time, but I've heard oh. that story from yes, my colleagues. You know, and it's, it's, yeah, it's a legend. Around. You can um, see, I saw it before it was actually removed, and you could see that it was ripped and damaged. So I yeah. wonder if it got repaired and it was okay. Yeah. <laughs> it was It was okay. It didn't return um, to the site, but um, the artist took it in stride. Um, actually you know it got him a little additional publicity so he that was the way he looked at it the artist oh. name uh, was tony metelli that's right tony tony metelli yes thank you it was great and this one is going to be great too it's about time you know after this yes. pandemic year that we have some, some stuff going on again to be very nice to see we had our site visits like january or february of last year deborah no, we did them in the fall. Oh, that was good foresight, I guess, for us. <laughs> yeah. Ken, did you have another question? Or no, your hand's still up. Okay. Did I don't think oh Mark, please. So uh, Julian put into the QA a question that I or a, a variant of a question I was curious about too. Um, so maybe we can, uh, well, I was about to say kill two birds with one stone, but that would be thoroughly inappropriate tonight, wouldn't it? Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, uh, anyway, so um, uh, the question was, uh, Julian's question was about the weight. And I recall yeah. in previous presentations that there were some sort of iron or steel panel that spanned across um, the supports for the subway tracks so that all that weight wasn't sitting just on one beam or something. Can you speak to how these are going to be supported and why we shouldn't worry about riding the subway? Um, yes. Um, well, um, in addition to what I'll tell you, um, um, Elizabeth and, and Matt 
uh, both check the weights and the calculations as well and need to approve them before we um, are authorized to go ahead. So um, these, you know, they, they are mounted on, on bases and um, in locate and they're heavy. I mean, they're, um, thought I, let me just see, I thought I had all the weights here in my notes and I don't. I noticed one of them was 6,000 yeah. pounds. Yes, yes. Um, they, in, um, actually the concerns about the weights and, and placement um, is not only the subways, but also, for example, at Dante, they have the hex paving and, you know, we need to be careful of that. So um, that sculpture will go on a um, rubberized matting mat, which we has been used in the past. So we don't have any rust stains or anything of that type. Um, and um, the these are, the weight is similar to uh, a number of sculptures that we've exhibited in the past, and uh, they've all, you know, gone in these locations. So uh, I think you can comfortably ride the subway. Any questions? Any, anyone else? Okay. Larry, did you? What? Deborah, what, the the exhibition will be up in the beginning of May, or our um, our expectation is that we will um, install during the first two weeks of May. Great. Okay. We'll have a we'll have a specific date soon. Deborah, I don't know that any of us would be a, a customer or a client to buy any of these. But can you give us a rough idea of what they sell for? Um, they sell for a lot of money. Um, I don't yet know, but it's, um, I think there are six figures. Hmm. It's, um, you know, they, um, they started life, um, at quarries in Italy and uh, a lot of work has been done. And, uh, um, and we do have an artist who's, you know, well known in, uh, in his community. Um, but if, if you know any friends who, who are collectors, why <laughs> put in a good word. <laughs> Mark Diller, are you interested, Mark? <laughs> You have to ask. You can't afford. Just it. having fun. <laughs> yeah, but, but I wouldn't. I wouldn't rush to cash the check. Yeah. <laughs> I saw you very intrigued, Mark. <laughs> thank you very, very much, Deborah. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you. It's such a pleasure to come Barbara, and speak to you. A question for the minutes. Barbara. Yeah. A question for the minutes. Um, I forget, did you say when they'll come down? Is it December? Or? Um, we don't have a, uh, we don't have a date. Um, they are typically, it, it's varied. Um, they may come down in the fall or they may um, be up through the winter. We, we just don't know yet. Thanks. The usual is around nine months. Um, for temporary public art, one year is the limit. So usually with um, Broadway Mall Association, I think most of your exhibitions are between nine and 12 months. But Deborah and I will talk about, we can talk about that. So Elizabeth, that actually gives rise to an administrative question because it sounds like temporary public art is actually a, an official term. Is, it, do they not have to go through the public art, uh, the, the design commission because they are temporary public art? That's correct. It's not like a permanent alteration to the site. You know, most exhibitions are only there for maybe six months, three months, um, shorter than that. Okay, well, 
I have a question. What's the process for selecting the artists? Um, so we actually, well, I guess for Broadway or just in general for public art? Broadway. I'll let Deborah answer that one. <laughs> um, we have a committee. Um, one of our committee members has a museum background and is um, uh, quite well known in the gallery and art community. Um, people come to us um, with interest. We reach out um, to people, that, to artists and galleries that we think might, um, you know, have a, a connection with an artist. Um, you know, years ago, it was galleries that uh, some of the big galleries, Marlboro was a big factor in this. Um, you know, they came to us and wanted to showcase their artists this way. The art world has really changed. Um, galleries, you know, now have to go to art fairs around the world. That's very expensive. I think they've been less active in public art than many of them had before. So the challenge is, uh, there's no simple answer to your question. Um, the challenge is to find, scope, find work that we're interested in that we think is worthy to go on Broadway and artists and gallerists and friends who um, are able to help us get it there. Okay, thank you very much. I'll ask one other follow-up question, Deborah. Just, just these, these art installations, do they have any fundraising aspect for the Broadway Mall Association that you can then use for, for planting your activities? Um, there's no direct, um, you know, I wouldn't say there's a direct relationship. It's not I revenue know, producing. I, I, I know that some of our donors um, contribute because they like the exhibitions, but there's, you know, there isn't any sort of direct tie-in. So thank you, Elizabeth and Deborah. Thank you both very much. So, Polly, are you there? Last month, um, uh, we asked for a volunteer, somebody who would uh, be willing to watch an online webinar on environmental justice. And the only person who volunteered was Polly and she's gonna give us a report on that tonight. So thank you again for doing that. I hope you- Yeah, uh, yeah thank you, Barbara. That was a wonderful uh, webinar. Um, actually, it was a town hall on environmental justice and I learned so much. Um, so what I did is I did a presentation, a bridge version, because there was so much information to digest. So I just kind of highlighted the key points. So can I share my screen with you guys? Please. Yeah. Okay, sure. cool. Well, I win, Polly, because I told Barbara I knew you would have, have something to present because you're very thorough. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think I go? I'm telling you, Polly is very detailed. She's going to have a presentation. Yeah, so I'm going to have my presentation uh -huh. ready. Very happy that I win the bet. Just so. Right, you do. <laughs> you just have to show me how to do the, uh, the, the uh, share now because I'm sharing the screen. So press the green screen, sh share screen. Um, Adam? At the bottom. Okay, gotcha. And should allow you to do it. All right, cool. So I have share. All right. Then it says desktop or application. Desktop if it's on the desktop. Okay, I got it. All right, I got it. And that right, should share. And now okay. that we should be seeing your screen. Yep, and we do. Yep. Oh, okay, cool. All right, let me come out of this. All right, good. All right. Put a full screen there, yeah. All right, can you see that? You can. Yeah. Okay, great. Perfect. Okay, um, so as I said earlier, um, 
The webinar, there was a lot of uh, information to digest. I just extrapolated, you know, the key high points. I also have a link to the webinar that I'll send you, Barbara, so this way you could distribute it to the other committee members. Um, so basically the questions that were presented to us is what is environmental justice, right? And what I learned is that it's the development, information, and enforcement of laws, regulations, and policies that foster the distribution of environmental benefits. And, and basically what that's talking about is to make sure we have like clean water, clean air, um, access to parks, uh, you know, dealing with health issues, uh, mental issues, hygiene. So back in 2017, Mayor de Blasio signed these two laws, local law 60 and 64, into office uh, when he got into office, which codified environmental justice in the city's decision-making process. And so using these laws as the framework, they developed an advisory board in order to carry out the legal mandate of these laws. So the board is made up of professionals from diverse backgrounds in the areas of conservancy, education, health, and law. And most of the board members were there at the webinar. Um, so each one gave their presentation on what their role is on the board. And basically their job is to advise the city on the implementation of laws number 60 and 64. All right, so after establishing the board, a roadmap was developed to address the environmental justice concerns by convening a working group of 19 city agencies to identify environmental justice areas. And I'll go into that into the next slide, what that means, and specific concerns through a study and a report. So subsequently, they would use this information to create a web portal that contains environmental justice maps, data, and programs. And as I said, in the webinar, there was a lot of information that we had to digest in a short period of time because it was like an hour and a half. So they did go over what those areas are um, and basically what the profile of the areas should be and gave us some statistics. We looked at some portals as well. So the profile that they gave us is that an environmental justice area is defined as areas that are low income with a below poverty level of 23.59% out of the total population and minority communities that are 51.1% of the total population. So we did get a chance to look at a portal because they get this information from a census, from the census. And um, there are pockets in our area on the Upper West Side that fit this particular profile. So in the link that I'm sending to Barbara, you guys can at your own leisure, you know, look at that map and the different um, areas that they've identified. Um, so again, local law 60 and 64 mandates that a report must fulfill a minimum of 10 legal requirements and the report must be updated every five years. So really the focus of the webinar is to get feedback from the attendees and really from the community at large. They do want input from community boards, the district, all stakeholders in the community um, so that they can help develop this report. Now, the current status that the report is in right now is that the advisory board is developing topics and scopes of the report and is seeking feedback, as I said, from the community board, the council district, residents and other stakeholders. Um, so again, you know, has to satisfy 10 legal requirements that address climate, environmental and health concerns. So those areas deal with mental health, um, hygiene, um, access to parks, uh, diabetes, um, lead poisoning, this, this is a large parameter of issues. Um, what they have to do is assess the environmental outcomes and review programs and policies along with the 19 city agencies that impact the community and also to make sure that we as a community are involved in any decision-making process. Um, I learned a lot during this webinar, to be honest with you. First of all, I didn't even know that the advisory board existed. Um, I didn't know the scope of what they do. 
Um, so again, you know, it was very um, intense, a detailed information. It's a magn It's a lot of work, I'll be honest with you, that they're taking on their shoulders and I can understand why they would like feedback from the community. Um, so this is a timeline, um, February to April, which we're in right now, they would like for us to help develop the draft report and the scope. And then by June, they want us, the public, the community, to comment on the draft report and the scope of whatever information they gather. And then July through September of 2022, prepare solutions for the environmental justice plan. And then during the period of December of this year and February of uh, next year, they want feedback again from all stakeholders on the plan and then January again to comment on the plan. So if you think about it in 2017, because that's when the law went into effect and they're saying that the report has to be done every five years. So you figure that's why we have this timeline of the year 2022. So right now, currently the whole purpose of the webinar, as I said, was basically to get feedback from us as a focus group to begin with, but they really wanted us to turn key this information back to the community board, um, you know, to whoever we uh, work with in our own networks. And so, you know, me, myself, I would like to follow through with, you know, giving information back to um, the advisory board, because I think it's important. And some of the uh, portals that they utilized were the, um, Parks and Recreation Portal, uh, City Planning Portal, um, and basically the information that they're extrapolating right now is public information. So I was just thinking as the committee, you know, and as a board, we could do a lot, you know, to assist them in giving them feedback because there are issues that we have to deal with right now currently in our community. Thank you. Polly, this was amazing. I didn't expect that you were going to go to so much work and it really is it's great. Now, my question is, do you think that we should um, bring this as a joint uh, committee with, uh, with, with HHS? I know yeah. Catherine was on earlier, but had some kind of work thing and had to get off. Yes, definitely. You I totally feel that we should yeah. work jointly with the, the uh, health committee. Mm -hmm. Polly, so, Polly, do you think that... Um, what about, I mean, uh, you said city planning is involved in this department. Of city planning. Right, it was city planning, uh, parks and recreation. Um, they're extrapolating information from that portal. There's two um, initiatives, walk to park initiative and uh, let's see, street tree map. So what they did is, you know, when you were speaking earlier about Central Park and how they had identified every tree in Central Park, there is a portal. <laughs> where they have identified all the trees in different areas of the city. So I just found that, you know, connection when they were talking about Central Park and the birds, et cetera. Um, one mm -hmm. of the issues too, when I looked at the portal, I do know that the public housing uh, landscape was in that map as being one of the, I'll say pockets of low income poverty, areas so you know that's what i wanted to look at um there was someone on the advisory board who is a public housing resident um she's from queens um she's focusing on lead poisoning because of that issue that came up within the public housing throughout new york city mm -hmm. right so um i noticed on that map that yes on about, I would say like in the 80s and the 90s near Central Park, there was like a blue icon there. And that kind of indicates that, yes, those areas are, you know, identified as environmental justice areas of concern. Well, maybe what we should do, we won't do it tonight, but maybe we should um, try to- well, I sent you the link um, to the portal. And and a webinar because like I said it's a lot of information to digest tonight to be honest with you um but if you look at that I'm going to show you at the end of the presentation that I did there's the contact information so I'll share that with you 
Okay, what I was going to say is maybe we should put together a couple of volunteers from this committee, possibly from our HSS committee, possibly from our land use committee to work as a sort of working group uh, to um, help provide input for this report that has been made. Right, so here's the contact information. Adriana Espinoza is the senior advisor to City Hall on this. And um, as I said, I sent information to you, Barbara. Thank you. I will. Uh, this way you could disseminate the um, webinar to everyone else on the committee. Absolutely. And I will also send it to um, the HHS committee. And um, I've been in touch with Catherine about this. And um, okay. I, they're very interested also. So. And maybe you could share the deck too, Polly, because it's kind of a good short summary that you can share as well. So, yeah. Um, you know, I think. Right. I already sent it technical. to Barbara, you know, because I don't have everyone's email. So that's why I just sent everything to Barbara, you know, because yeah. I figured she has everyone's email so she could, you know, disseminate. <laughs> All right. Uh-huh. But as I said, I just feel that, you know, once I understood what they were doing and how important this work is and how it relates to us, not only as a committee, but as, you know, as a community at large, you know, we're all dealing with a lot of these issues that they described, okay? You know, diabetes, you know, lead poisoning, air, water, you know, quality of life, basically. It's, it's a massive undertaking. And uh, there's a timeline on the report. And I just feel that we should be part of that uh, group that gives information about what's going on in our community. Because I was told that they did send out this information to all the community boards in New York City, but they didn't get a huge response. They got a response from community board eight in the Bronx, right? But not too many community boards in Manhattan responded to the webinar. Right. for some reason yeah so i think you know community board seven i think we should take on a role in advocating you know for environmental justice what is the next date that they're looking for feedback on this is the, is it right the timeline that they gave is between now and april uh next month we don't have much time <laughs> no, there, no there isn't much time yeah, yeah. Um, basically, I'll go back into the um, presentation and give you the timeline again. All right. Uh, let's see. Can you guys see that? Yeah. All right. So from February to April 21st, you know, 2021, next month, is no specific date. They just gave us a timeline to help develop the draft report in scope. And then June, there will be a session where they will comment on the draft report and the scope. But I just feel between now and next month, right, we could put something together in regard to our area because there is a link in the portal that designates some pockets here on the Upper West Side as environmental justice areas of concern. There are three questions in the Q&A mm -hmm. Um, that um, two from Ira Gershenhorn, the first one from Pamela Procia, mm -hmm. says, what is the best way to send a suggestion on this to CB7? Thank you, Stephen. Um, I don't know how our office is working these days. Uh, how, what is the best way for Pamela Procia to send a suggestion on this to CB7? I mean, if without us starting a process, so we kind of hone who's the point person, there are, you know, we have two general emails on our website. If they wanted to uh, uh, send something and just identify that this is uh, something we want to get to the parks committee regarding this subject, uh, John or Penny traditionally would forward it on. So I, uh, I would, would say that would be the short term, would be to follow up with the website uh, and the two emails on there for uh, until a next, you know, we can have another parks meeting and we'll probably have this a little bit more delved out. Maybe there'll be another email to go to. Okay, so that's the answer for Pamela and uh, Ira's two questions concerned which areas in our district are um, uh, subject to these requirements. I think 
colleagues somewhat answered that, but not with great specificity. I didn't hear. What did you say, Clary? Um, I'll say, Clary. Yeah. I think your I think your uh, volume's a little. Uh, it's it's kind of coming in and out. So oh. I'll just read it. I sure, wrote. Sure. I was one email is Polly. Was there a map of the areas that met the two requirements? And then I don't know if this is kind of a second part. Are there any areas in CB7 that met the two requirements? I don't know if you yeah, know. That yes, answer. there were. There is a map and a portal that the advisory board has created um, to identify these areas. And yes, there were areas here, uh, CB7 footprint that fit that criteria. Thank you. So, so what I wanted to suggest, if you know whoever is in the audience that's interested, you know, to leave their name and information because I do know that the representative from the webinar said they would be willing to come to our board meeting and speak to us if we were interested in you know putting together a, a group to help work on getting this information you know for our area. So it's interesting. Yeah. I did want to point out Jeanette has her hand up now, so, so uh, make sure that she gets a chance to ask her question. Please, Jeanette. Uh, yes, uh, wonderful presentation, Polly. Thank you. Uh, historically, environmental justice has very much been a result of land use decisions. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd love to have this at our committee. Okay. I was thinking that I don't know if you can participate, but I was thinking maybe you could give the same presentation um, at our uh, our next our next meeting. As and I don't know, Steve, we could either do it as new business and not change the agenda, or we could tack it on as a third item on the agenda. Listen, I'll I'll defer to you on your on your meeting, you know, but. Um... Why don't we okay. why don't we follow up with Polly and even check her availability? But we can figure out a way. But I think it makes a lot of a lot of sense to get this involved both in land use and other committees. And, and right. I do think, I, first of all, thank you so much for doing this, Polly. And uh, I'm really glad that you, did, you moved forward. And I'm happy to see CB7 taking. You know, we were one of the few that took initiatives. So let's mm -hmm. just make sure. Why don't we agree to follow up after this, and we'll figure out a path. But I think it's relevant to several other committee members. Yes. And I, maybe, I, it, maybe it makes sense to have them kind of come back and present and that can be a broader, okay. uh, you know, maybe either it's at a steering meeting or a combined meeting across the board, but uh, really important stuff. And I, 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 I agree. It's really important. And we, unfortunately, we don't have much time. So we'll have to come up with some way okay. to involve everybody who wants to be involved with this. Mm -hmm. And yeah, okay. I'd be glad to, like I said, I'll just check my schedule, Jeanette. I'll be glad to present to the land, but I also feel that we should invite them to present to steering also, you know, because next month is like the timeline that they have set um, to gather the information and they might make an extension, you know, but we'll, 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 how about this? We'll, let's, we'll, we'll follow up and we'll figure it out, but we'll right. make sure. Okay, that that's exactly. Let's do that. Okay. okay. And thank Thanks you. Again. Thanks again. again, Polly. You're welcome. Bravo. Thank you, Polly. All right. Unfortunately, hey, there, there's, oh, Barbara. I'm sorry. Um, Maureen Hallahan, uh, it, it has some new business. Um, and um, if she, somebody could elevate her so she could speak, please. She's one of the attendees. Yes. Unfortunately, we're not going to have tonight updates on our committee business, but uh, Maureen wants to uh, talk about something in new business. Okay, so I, I promoted her to panelist, and okay. she will be able to put on her video and speak. Same. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. Maureen, can you Maureen, hear us? You're, uh, you're on. You're muted. Ah. Great. You're muted still. Great. Hi, everybody. There you go. Uh, this is my first night on in, in a meeting at all in any capacity, and I just wanted to say that I've, I've been listening on and off. Um, I wanted to mention two things. One, I'm going to, going to talk about the parks and their, the parks district and it's how it's handling permits. One of the safest places for kids to be right now is outside playing sports. And I, I didn't push too hard in the fall because in the fall, they allowed soccer to play outside. They allowed baseball to play outside with permits because they felt as though basketball was too close of a sport, was too risky. 
So I, I backed off to make sure that that, you know, we were safe about that. But uh, as far as COVID, what we've learned in the meantime is that um, outside, there's really no transmission of it. We, we have had COVID cases in our workouts. The Notre Dame football team has had COVID cases and they haven't passed it outside. So we waited to, to gather all this data. And as of last Monday, the mayor okayed all inside basketball for high school players with masks on. But for some reason, the park district is really slow to, to allow for youth basketball permits outside. But Maureen, hold on a second, because I think this is just coming completely out of context. Um, can you just spend a minute or two telling us what your organization, Mo Motion, is? We've heard about it in the past. Okay. Um, um, people okay. don't understand why you're talking now. Okay, so I, my name is Maureen Hillan. I run Mo Motion, and I actually know Steve Brown from the gym. <laughs> I, I was going to wait, Maureen, if you recognize like, me. I know. I was like, I know that guy. I played it's basketball. quite a while. <laughs> and usually I'm like, oh, no, did I elbow the guy in the face? You know, like, I'm hopefully we're on oh. good terms. But Steve is tough. He's still good. Still got a bruise. I still got a bruise. I know. I know. Um, so I, I ran this program when I, I met Steve. I was a teacher, and I ended up running my own basketball program. It actually started in Riverside Park at 76th Street. If you go by the park today, those awful, terrible rims and backwards that used to be there are no longer there because as a, as a 10-year anniversary celebration, uh, we replaced the hoops at Riverside Park. So those plexiglass, single rims at Riverside Park that has been probably our greatest contribution to the community um, due to the pandemic. All the people have benefited from those hoops. So I'm happy to share and I don't wanna hog the space and I'm not looking to my, run my business there, but what has been really um, hard for me is to see all the youth basketball programs that are now going inside to play because it's spring AU ball and people have been pent up for so long when I feel strongly that the city should be promoting outside basketball. They should be opening up the permits division for basketball outside because we know it's significantly safer than going indoors. In the fall, soccer was allowed. Kids were playing without masks on. Flag football was allowed. And they kept saying basketball was high risk. So over the course of the fall and winter, what we learned is through the Notre Dame football team who, who they were breathing all over each other and not spreading COVID. I had COVID, didn't pass it to a kid because I had a mask on. Another coach had COVID, didn't pass it. I am really impatient now with the parks division and also the city. I'm like, you have to issue permits for youth basketball because if you don't, more and more kids are gonna go inside because kids grade K through eight, they can't go outside and get in a pickup game. They get run over by men, they get run over by teenagers. Um, there's guys smoking weed out on the courts. There's guys playing for money. Kids have nowhere to go that, so that they can be supervised for two hours. And I'm talking and like a fifth grade kid. So not interrupt you, but in all serious, I, I had three meetings with the permits over the last month for the West Side Little League. So why don't you, you know, what is the status that they're not even taking your permits or they're not taking your, just give me the status. You, you, had, you had some of us said hello, so don't worry about it. We all want people okay. in sports outside, but just tell me your status. I'm going to jump in just because I've had literally these yes. meetings as the last one. And Stephen, I think we can get some input from Jeff Martin about this as well. Um, Okay, so right. I just wanted to get Maureen's right. request first, and sure. then you can go to Jeff. So, so what one, are you for? I, I youth sports permits have been allowed for baseball, soccer, flag football since the fall. They have not allowed youth basketball permits. They still do not allow it as of this okay. moment. Okay. So we need youth basketball permits. The second thing I want to add is all the others so really the great ideas I heard tonight. I'm happy to sponsor a basketball tournament to co-promote some other cause in the neighborhood. You know, environmental justice or, or what, what, whatever. Like, I am happy as a nonprofit to do more things at these parks so that we bring kids together for free because so much youth sports, as Steve knows, is pay to play. Like, having a weekend, like New York City, we made it through the winter. Like, let's have a three on three basketball tournament. Momotion would love to be involved in sponsoring free basketball tournaments. Um, we just need the permits and we just can't get them now. Okay, great. I, I know the, to, to Clary's point, let's ask Jeff. I know that they have been issuing Little League. Jeff, do you know any update on where basketball permits could, let, could, could be? Sorry, I had to get the screen back. I don't know. Um, I'll find out um, what's going on with the basketball permits. Um, 
And, and that's, that's all I can really tell you right now. I know that as you, as you know, they're starting to issue permits for uh, little leagues and stuff. Yeah. So we, we found out about that recently. And so um, I don't know anything about youth basketball. Uh, let me uh, put a note in and I'll, and I'll find out. Jeff, Jeff, to what extent has the 76th Street Court in Riverside Park been permitted in the past? As opposed to just pick up games? Um, well, I, as far as like oh, tournaments okay. or something like that, or, or youth? I mean, was it, was it, when I go by, it always, as far as I can tell, is pick up games. But, we, um, we've had a couple of organizations in the past, um, and I can't remember, I'd have to look them up. Um, and, but that we've had uh, on weekdays uh, in the afternoons, uh, like after school basketball clubs. I think we've had about uh, anywhere from two to four organizations at Newfeld, working out of Newfeld, um, from last from from the, the previous year. So I was I'm I'm there now for I'm at River been at Riverside for two years, uh, and you know one year has been pandemic. So I do remember last year when we had to start shutting down everything. I I looked all this up to see uh, who was. Uh, getting uh, uh, permits at Newfeld, and I do remember there was a, there was a couple of organizations. Uh, one was like an after school program, and I believe another one was also on the weekends. I just remember those two, so I, I could pull that information uh, and check it out. But um, I guess but the bigger question is going to be uh, when when could we get youth basketball? permits uh, back in session but as far as tournaments go I don't I don't remember any tournaments being permitted uh, you know the previous year before Maureen how does that how does that measure your experience there well the the after school slot I think should really be sacred time for kids and while I'd love to get a permit for one full court I don't really think that's fair you know, getting a permit for one basket would allow my kids a safe place to play. But what you find if you walk by West 76th Street is you have private trainers out there who are hogging the hoops for one kid. And that's something I just avoid because I do think the sacred time for kids after school, because they have no place to play due to COVID is three to 5 p.m. So it was upsetting to me this past week when I mean, I had a guy who would not leave the court after playing for two hours and was playing for money. So my kids, there were 12 of us trying to play on one hoop, like four and four and four, winner stay on. And this guy was shooting during the middle of the game and smoking weed and he was betting money. And I just, I had a right to the parks and I'm like, I can't handle the fact that these guys are taking up after school time. So I would not want a permit necessarily for West 76th Street. But on the weekends, like it's a great spot to have one court reserved. I mean, those guys play for four hours. And, and if you want to get on or you want to share, they won't share with us. So I think like having my motion, having a one court is fair. There's seven hoops. And then under the overpass, when it gets fixed is nice. There's courts up at West 101. If the courts are crowded, I'm not there to upset people. I can go to another court. I'm not there to hog, but, but we can't get anything. But I'm telling you now, these, these young kids are going in gyms and they're in gyms without windows and they're playing without masks. Stephen, it sounds like you probably are our best point person on this because you're already involved in the permitting, your, your relationships and permitting other sports. Yeah, again, if, um, if Maureen, if you don't have my email, I think if you converse okay. with Natasha, you could share it on or, and, and just follow up with a, a kind of a rec say, this is what I'm looking for. And then I'll reach out. Uh, we actually may have the permit people. And there was a conversation about maybe having them at a meeting because there's lots of conversations about uh, sort of youth sports being taken over by a new, uh, a new, you know, they're starting a new department. And there was actually a big hearing on this over the last month, if you weren't aware of it. But I, I do know the point people and I can reach out and uh, I'll do so in, uh, with, you know, working with Jeff as well. I think I can get it, at least an answer or some direction on basketball and then we'll play it from there. And I think to your point, you know, underneath the overpass has got a lot of, I mean, maybe just easier to get there. Uh, 76 is, you know, uh, has a lot of people on it and that's a little hectic, but there's many other basketball courts on Riverside besides that area. 
and I'd be happy to try and figure something out and, uh, and think I know who to reach out to. Okay, great. I put my email in the, in the chat, if that helps. Does that, does that mean you'll give me like a six point lead and a one-on-one -on -one yeah. next time we play? Well, during, when the guy was giving me a hard time, he's like, let's shoot for the court. And I would have been so mad if I lost that shooting game in front of the kids, so I didn't do it. I just was like, don't get upset. And I decided to jump in the meeting, but I thank you uh, for your time. And I, I'm glad I connected with Steve. I actually saw you on the street last week, but I didn't think you'd recognize me. So we're good now. I recognize him. Okay. I want you to know that Maureen's a very good basketball player. It was, was. I'm sure you're still very good. All right. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you, Natasha, for bringing uh, Maureen back to us. Okay. Um, any new business, anybody? Jeff, did you want to say something? I do. Um, just a couple of things. Um, one uh, is not permitted for people to smoke uh, anything, uh, tobacco, marijuana, anything like that on parks property. Uh, so if, if anybody ever needs to, to call me, I can get park enforcement over there. Uh, for something like that. Um, it is not permitted that people gamble on parks property either. So, uh, so all these things are not permitted. Uh, so, you know, if, if, if anybody sees these things happening, uh, give me a call, um, email me or, or text me, uh, let me know. Uh, I'll get park enforcement uh, over there as soon as possible uh, to take care of that. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention is right now the status of the outdoor basketball court, and we put signs up, it's for training purposes only. Uh, so, um, you know, people are allowed to go in uh, with kids um, and, and you know, teach them uh, basketball skills. So skills training is right on the sign uh, outside is permitted right now. Um, so that, that's just something to clarify uh, on that. Um, right now, games like adult games and stuff like that are not. It's basically skills and. and... Natasha, audio. Hi. Yeah, I just had a few, a couple of things. Jeff, thank you so much for um, clarifying the thing about smoking and gambling. What would be the best number to reach you at? I don't think. I don't think I have that. And I've seen that kind of stuff happening also. Uh, I also wanted to um, give a shout out to Maureen. You know, I can vouch for her program. My children have actually attended her program. Kids in my extended family have also. It's a very well-run professional woman-owned business. She's an employer and she's just trying to run a business. But it seems like this is an issue that is just going to come up now in the days of COVID and now that the weather is getting better and fewer places indoors are open. You know, this like sharing of public space by different constituents uh, you know, the older guys who are just doing this for fun or gambling and the, um, you know, organizations, nonprofits like Maureen's, you know, I think we do have to figure out a way to, to share our space better now and whether it, it um, means, you know, better enforcement by Jeff and his team or maybe a meeting with the permits people in, um, in, our, in one of our parks committee meetings coming up, I, I would really advocate for all of that. Thank you. Okay, does anyone else have any new business? No? Okay, then I think this meeting might be ending. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, do I need a motion to end? No. Okay, then no motion and good night, everybody. <laughs>